Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today are three ladies from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, and they have a care partner study and a guide that they've produced. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today, but they've also got some really great strategies to share with us. So welcome, Alka, Marlene, and Susan. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. Having us. We're excited to be here. Wonderful. So who would like to start and explain what your study is and what you're hoping to learn and accomplish through this study? Because you guys are coming at caregiving, helping caregivers from a little different perspective and I personally think a little bit better perspective. Thanks. Well, um, Jennifer, again, we've just, we're so happy to be here today and be able to share um, with you and just, you know, we're followed the amazing work that you're doing and advocating for care partners and, and getting the word out. And so we appreciate the opportunity to to be here today and get to talk to you um, and share a little bit about the work that we're doing. So um, like you said, we have a little bit of a different take um, on um, caregiving on care partners. I think one of the um, kind of important distinctions is even in our choice of words. Initially, um, you know, we focus more on care partners um, to emphasize more of a dual relationship role um, that really helps emphasize maintaining kind of that independence. Um, of the care recipient, of the person living with dementia, to maintain that dignity and independence as long as possible. And think of that caregiver relationship as being something that's collaborative, um, so that um, it's not just kind of like one person doing and the other one only receiving. Um, And so, um, but, you know, that all being said, we recognize, you know, um, I'm going to be preaching to the choir now, you know, the (laughs) number of just challenges that care partners live with, right? And how that can be developmental and they increase over time. And so we we see the need and want to meet an area where we think there's a gap in the field of being able to essentially provide direct support to care partners. A lot of the services that that are available And just, you know, a lot of this is unfortunately driven by insurance, right? A lot of what insurance covers and is reimbursable um, is uh, what's given directly to the care recipient and not the care partner as a whole. And so we're developing interventions that are accessible, that are really low cost and can be um, delivered by a number of um, healthcare professionals like mental health that don't need a whole... um, you know, uh, many, many years of schooling and education just to try to eliminate barriers and access. Um, so okay. our, um, our study is about um, essentially using problem-solving training um, to adapting that for care partners of adults living with dementia. And so it essentially consists of, um, of practicing and implementing a number of different steps that um, can be used towards any types of day-to-day things, like even, um, you know, getting to getting to my appointments on time or getting in the exercise that I'm trying to get in, I've been trying to do forever, and I can't seem to find the time to do. Um, so that it could be really practical for just day-to-day things. Um, a big part of our intervention is helping care partners realize that they we're not saying they don't have any problem solving skills, you know, we just want to help build those skills that they already have and just give them like an extra tool in their toolbox that they can take out whenever they feel the need to. Um, all the problem solving training does have like specific steps. It is very uh, adaptable to like personal situations. Um, so you can really tailor it toward what is important to you at the time, what you want to prioritize at the time, you know, and just make it specific to you, but while also following like a systematic uh, problem solving approach that that helps you break down bigger goals or problems into like smaller steps in the hopes that they become uh, less overwhelming and can be like more feasible to accomplish. So we want to help empower care partners um, instead of being like, 
we know this, you know, just kind of like a, uh, we also want to be a partner in their relationship, not necessarily like we're, we know better than you do, but you know. Yeah. Just sometimes hearing something at the right time is beneficial. Whereas you hear a tip and then two years later, you're like, why didn't I take advantage of that tip? Or why didn't I start using that? I've, I'm sure most of us have experienced that going to like a conference or a workshop. And then two years later, you kind of review your notes and you're like, well, duh, why haven't I been doing that? <laughs> so it's, it kind of does go across the board. And I'm not sure that most people are aware until it happens to them that helping out another older adult or becoming a care partner, it can, it's like, I equate it to being like stuck in quicksand because you know, you're helping out like here, perfect example, the beginning of the pandemic, my husband was delivering meals on wheels because the normal real estate meeting that he went to every Tuesday was on hiatus because of the pandemic and he needed something to do. And he also ended up grocery shopping for this other older woman who has cancer. And over a year later, it's like, Am I just going to do this until one of us dies? I have, you know, he's like, my life is now moving in different directions. And it took a little bit of time to find somebody to take over. And he's like, excuse me, but he basically just, he said, that's it. I'm done as of this week. I will do it on Tuesday and then I'm done. And he's like, he, he felt really badly because, you know, she does need the help, but it's like, you he's had to, having to go to a different grocery store than we shop at. So he can't just incorporate it with what, you know, like he goes to the grocery store like every other day for us, which is ridiculous. I know, but that's, that's his life. It's like his hobby. And, you know, it just a little nicety, a little benefit to her during the pandemic, something else for him to do to make him feel good. Next thing you know, it's like this giant responsibility that nobody else wants to take over, including her own family. And it's like, hello. And I find that to be the case. For most of us that start helping an older adult, a family member, a neighbor, whatever, next thing you know, you're like up to your neck going, wait a minute, what happened to my life? So problem solving is definitely, definitely a good thing. It would helps to not get in that situation, but then we do need to help our neighbors in our community because that's just, that's just what we need to do. We can't just rely on everybody else to do it because that would not work. So tell me a little bit about your study, what you're trying to learn, what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, we touched on it a little bit, but let's go into a little bit more depth and then we can kind of talk about some of the tips that you guys have that are, the, their, their guide is fantastic. You can get it off my website. It's also linked in the show notes. I highly recommend downloading it and checking it out because if I thought it was really good and I've seen lots of them. That's a really good endorsement, if I do say so myself. <laughs> so I do just want to butt in here um, and kind of reiterate some of what um, uh, Dr. Vega and, and Jennifer, I think you already mentioned. But I think, um, you know, I've um, a lot of us, I think, on our team have been on the other side, have been care partners and you know, one of the things that drew me to this study um, is that, you know, my mother was diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia in 2007. And so that was a long time ago. That was a long before we knew a lot about frontotemporal dementia. Even neurologists didn't really know what it was. Um, and my, my dad was her primary care partner. Um, and I could tell, you know, he was having to do these problem solving things all the time on his own. And that he wasn't, it felt like he wasn't getting a lot of support. And I think a lot of us, when we're in that care partner role, it's like you said, we're just sort of thrust into it. Nobody gives us any training on it. Um, and so we're just kind of trying to figure it out as we go. And now being on the other side of it as a behavioral neurologist, where I actually see these patients and treat them all the time and see how their care partners are struggling, I'm realizing we still don't really have those resources for our care partners. Um, so I think that's where this study plays a really crucial role, kind of a, it's a great resource that I'm actually able to offer my, my patients and their caregivers. So it's, it's really, that's what's been so great about it. Did either of the other two of you, so that was um, Elka. So 
Marlene and Susan, have you had care partner experience as well? Yeah, actually, my mother was care partner for her mother, um, who had kind of a vascular turning into Alzheimer's dementia for quite some time. So, um, so, so I was more on the periphery occasionally and being a support or, a, you know, assistance to her as being the primary care partner. I really got to see for firsthand and experience firsthand what, you know, so many care partners um, from just the burnout to the stress difficulty, um, uh, just kind of managing all of the priorities, the responsibilities, the behavioral issues that came up eventually, um, and just the toll that it took on her health too. Um, and so it's it's really special to be able to then, you know, not only as I think we've been drawn to this professionally, but then also, you know, we have this personal connection with our own experiences to um, just have a different perspective and be able to, um, you know, like we've been there, we've seen, we've seen what it looks like in the day to day. Um, so, um, you know, you, you've mentioned kind of shifting gears a little bit in terms of then, you know, there's the multiple demands, you know, we've talked about the multiple demands, um, problem solving on the spot, just having to do it as you go and figure it out as you go. Um, and one of the things that we've talked about too with you uh, previously, Jennifer, is just how care partners can figure out how to prioritize um, responsibilities or demands because they um, everything can seem urgent, everything seems important, um, and it could just be really hard to to tease that out. And so, um, you know, with the problem solving training, that's part of the process to do that. Um, but sometimes. Um, you know, for those that may not necessarily have the opportunity to go through the full process of the um, problem solving training with us, um, another kind of quick and, and dirty strategy that even I try to use myself just from day to day to somehow manage demands is this um, the uh, Eisenhower matrix. Um, and so, just if you would just kind of visualize a square in your mind, or if you have a sheet of paper on hand, drawing a square, and then within that square, drawing across so that you end up with four smaller boxes. Um, and then at the top left, we would put those things that are urgent. Um, at the top right, we would write in those things that are not urgent. Um, and then on the, um, on the uh, left, so we would be important. And then on the bot on the top, and then on the bottom, not important. So essentially, we would end up with four boxes. The first one being what's important and urgent. So what really needs to get done right now, um, and those would be the things that we would take action on right now. Um, the second box, so that upper right hand quadrant, would be important but not urgent. It has, doesn't have to get done right now. Um, and those are the types of things that then we can plan for. Um, and the really neat thing about problem solving training is that it also incorporates strategies to help set up things like SMART goals so that we can figure out how do we plan to come up with solutions and how do we prioritize the solutions and figure out which solution will work best. And when we try solutions and they don't work out, then let's go back to the drawing board and kind of problem solve and find alternate solutions. Um, um, but then kind of going back to the square, to the Eisenhower matrix, then on the lower bottom, then we would have the number three of what's urgent, but not important. And then those would be things that we can also um, delegate um, um, to others. And so with, you know, with uh, just managing caregiver demands, but if that support system is so important. Um, and so these are the things that perhaps don't require the hands-on assistant to the care recipient, to the um, loved one living with dementia. And then the fourth square would be those things that are not important and not urgent. Um, and those ideally would just kind of cross off your list early for later on. Um, so that can be just kind of a, a helpful strategy when you're in the moment, just trying to figure, on when, figure out what to do um, with so many of those demands coming at you. 
one of the things that I learned in the last year of my mom's life, she likely had an ovarian tumor, but the doctors weren't really interested in working. They didn't want to talk to me. They wanted me to make appointments and come in and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, not doing that. 99% certain we're not going to do anything about whatever this is because she was definitely end stage Alzheimer's. But it caused other issues where the care staff would call me and say, oh, I think your mom's got a UTI. And, oh, we got to call a doctor. Oh, it was always like, ah, urgent, <laughs> emergency. And I learned after a couple of times of like dropping everything, blowing up my schedule, dragging her to the doctor, which was always a nightmare. Because in these situations, it always seemed, I don't know if it was, it was probably my energy that caused her her to be negative. But it just, it was always ugly. I just learned, it's like, okay, it's Friday. I'm going to see her on Monday. You know, if she's worse, then we'll go to the doctor. If not, it's not a problem. And it took a little while because my initial reaction was, I need to take care of this. Wait, no, I don't necessarily because every time we've rushed to the doctor and gone through all the trauma to get a urine sample, <laughs> it's been negative. And so I'm not putting everybody through this trauma again. Not me, not her, not the doctor's office. I just kind of learned that you have to like sometimes take a step back and just breathe and go, okay, is this really urgent? Cause you know, we've done this before. And the, the tricky part of that was not feeling guilty, you know, cause it's like, you know, I'm like, I kept thinking one of these days I'm going to show up, but she's going to be really bad. And then I'm going to feel horrible because I postponed dealing with it, assuming it was a problem. And thankfully I never, Ended up with that, except the day she broke her leg. They told me she fell. They told me she didn't want to walk. That she didn't, that her, her knee was swollen. And I was just like, oh my God, just give me a break. This was right at the beginning of the pandemic. I'm like, I'm going to be there Monday anyway. Just, ugh. and it turns out her leg was broken. So it's like, okay, well, I didn't win any prizes that day. But it also didn't harm her because she didn't do anything. She didn't walk on it. We finally got her to the hospital. They, it, you know finally found out that it was broken and it was just like okay but yeah it's you know learning how to prioritize learning what is actually an emergency and what is maybe not an emergency all, all all part of the process unfortunately it's i guess as parents we kind of learn that as well my daughter's almost 30 so i'm trying to remember thankfully we didn't have too many of those is this really an emergency we got to rush to the doctor and or not <laughs> thankfully <laughs> So where, what, are, what is, yeah, mm. that's good. <laughs> and that's something we like to uh, reinforce with our part our care partners is, um, you know, it sounds like you've already tried some things out. Some things haven't worked. Some things have worked. So maybe let's try to help you implement this tool or this skill to help you continue maybe with what has worked. Um, and just emphasizing to keep trying, you know, if one thing didn't work out, that's okay. We can always go back and try something else. That is true. And do you guys find it easier to help people when they've had some successes, maybe identify like the components of the success or the tips that worked versus, I can't really think of an example, but like, the reason I started this podcast, this might be news to some, I know I have people that haven't been with me the whole time. So this might be news for some people and old news for others. I did reading internet research. I tried everything to connect with my mom after she moved into the memory care residence. And I was literally hitting a wall. I mean, it was like the music, the old family albums, reminiscing about days gone by none of it worked it was driving me bananas and she'd ask me the same question like literally every three minutes and after about five times of asking me the same question i ran out of answers because i would break she asked me what i was up to what have you been up to lately so i would tell her in little pieces and then i'd give her the whole piece and then i'd be out of like okay well now i don't know what to say because i've already answered your question five different times in five different ways and so i looked for a podcast to help me with that and Back in late 2017, there was one. Now there's a whole bunch of us. And I didn't like it. It wasn't my cup of tea. So I crazily started my own. And it's been great because I've learned a lot of stuff. Even now that my mom is gone, I'm still learning things. So 
I am very appreciative to people like you who come on and talk to me and my listeners, because if I'm learning new things, then other people have got to be learning things. So my question, back backtracking the smidgen, is do you find that you can utilize what has worked to kind of help propel them forward? Because that's kind of the path I took. I'm like, okay, none of this stuff, none of the stuff that everybody tells you, oh, you know, they connect so well with music. Well, my mom liked to listen to talk radio. So guess what? Music never worked. We ended up just going out and watching kids in the park or at the pool, the library, whatever the weather was, where we went and stalked out small children. And she just sat there and watched them. And it, being outside was beneficial for her. Her having something else to focus on was beneficial to me. And so I tried to expand on that, but she was definitely closer to the end of life and the end stages. So it was a lot harder. If I had started sooner, I think I might have had more success. So again, I'm going to repeat my question because I keep going off on tangents. I apologize. <laughs> Is it easier to help people when they have some nuggets of success to move them forward on that path? Absolutely. Um you know, building on successes, right? So part of the problem solving is um, brainstorming solutions, right? And then also then deciding which of those solutions or potential solutions would be more feasible and why. Um, and then that way deciding what, um, what, what's going to be your next course of action, right? So based on those potential solutions and feasibility of it. And then we're on past successes. I mean, it sounds like in your case, you tried different things, right? So there was a trial and error. You brainstormed trial and error, and then you saw what worked and what was successful, what she responded well to, and then went with that. But, you know, I, there's also this great flexibility that I'm hearing and what you described. That's another part of this process because something, a strategy that works or a solution that works for a while may not work forever. Um, and so we have to be flexible to go back to the drawing board. And, um, and that's where running through this cycle again, um, and, and excuse me, different steps. And, and it can be for different types of situations, right? So it might be the behavior, or it might just be how do we manage the schedule? Or how do I get sleep and rest as a care partner? Mm -hmm. It also speaks back to like that reinforcement of empowering the care partner, um, helping them realize that, you know, you are capable of doing things or making progress, you know, problem solving or, you know, accomplishing goals, whatever it may be that you want to do um, and helping you recognize that and helping you because at the end of the day you're the you're the one that knows your situation the best right you might tell me all this stuff and I might be like well that sounds like a problem it might sound like a problem to me but if it's not necessarily a problem to you or if it's not necessarily important to you then you know it wouldn't really take us anywhere so we really want to emphasize that you are the one that knows your situation the best you um, are capable of, you know, doing the things that you would like to do and reinforcing on those positives, in my experience, has helped, um, you know, change that way of, of thinking of like, I can't do this. Am I doing the right thing? You know, are you making progress, but focusing on the positive, mm -hmm. it does help. Uh, in short, it does help. <laughs> Right. Sometimes you just need someone to tell you that what you're doing the right thing, right? That what you're doing is, is you're, that you're doing it well. That reinforcement can go a long way. I wish general practitioners, you know, general physicians, like when you take your, your loved one in to the doctor for whatever reason, if they would just take 30 seconds and put their hand on your shoulder and say, I know this is tough, but you're doing a good job. Even if they don't know what you're doing, it's like, because her, my mom's neurologist told me that one day, I must have looked like a frazzled wreck because she only said it the one time and it meant so much to me. And I think that's just a little simple thing. It doesn't cost them any time. I mean, I know our health system is this challenged and it's one little thing people can do because I think a lot of times, like I still participate in my support group and sometimes it's, it's really hard because it's just so negative. It's like everybody's just so down and it's like, oh my gosh. You know, and I'm not the only person still participating in the support group who is past as post caregiving or post care partnering. Oh, that doesn't sound quite right. 
but I was going to ask a question. Let me see if I can word this so it makes sense without getting too wordy. Have you ever helped somebody who's just been like at the end of their rope, frustrated? They think nothing they're doing is right. Nothing's working. They're just, <laughs> they're just over it. Cause I've seen examples of that, like on social media and in the, particularly in the Facebook caregiver support pages, just some people just, they just want to vent. They just want to scream and cry. And it's like, okay, well, it's good to do that for a short period of time, but then you got to like get back on it and be, I guess I'm like super practical because I tried to find ways to make my mom happy and give her some quality of life. And that was my goal. And so I always had this goal and I try not to stray from it. And I think that helped a lot. It didn't make the whole process easier, but it helped kind of focus on, you know, like I'm not going to rush her to the doctor to get another negative UTI test because it just frustrates everybody. It just, you know, makes her miserable, makes me miserable. You know, we can wait 48 hours and see if she gets worse. And if she doesn't, then I know I'm okay. And if not, then I'll rush to the doctor and get the, the urine test. Um, but I'm wondering, have you helped people kind of like shift their perspective so that they can be more like what I was just describing. I don't know that I'm, I was I'm not going to say I was perfect or anything because I certainly wasn't, but I think you're, I think I'm making sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So it would, two things come to mind. Um, first I'll, I'll start with how we address those types of things um, and through the problem solving training intervention and the study. Right. And because the steps involved are for identifying different potential solutions and troubleshooting things that come up um, to help with being successful. Um, it, it really helps um, essentially either get ahead of the problem so that it doesn't necessarily escalate to a point where it doesn't feel manageable, or if it's already the situation is already to a point where it feels unmanageable then um, being able to talk to, to break it down. I think that's one of the things that really working with our intervention is, um, is one of the big benefits because we can kind of then not only have this, this avenue for being able to talk and vent, um, and there's someone who uh, is familiar with what care, um, being a care partner is and the issues that come up, but then you can have a sounding board too and someone who is skilled at also helping break this huge thing down, this mound into different, more manageable parts. And then also just being having someone that's on the outside that can point out what you're doing well. Um, and, um, and, and if something does not work out, then finding alternate um, solutions for it. Um, so th th that's one, you know, one thing that really comes to mind that I think the problem problem solving training helps address being able to cope with um, caregiver stress. Um, and then the other thing that comes to mind is also how just going through the care partner process in some ways is a lot like um, going through a grief process as well. Just, you know, there's a lot of emotions involved um, from accepting that there is a loss of a loved one, right? There's ambiguous loss when your loved one is changing the personality or just, you know, when the loved one does not recognize you or gets confused. Um, and just like there are these kind of stages of grief in terms of like the Kuba Ross, um, I don't know if you've heard of those, right? But just when we talk about losses, um, it was developed more in the, in the context of loss of, of life and losing a loved one, right, from um, kind of denial, anger, bargaining, acceptance. Um, and um, that when we're dealing with stressful life situations and adapting to new circumstances, as part of that coping process, a lot of times we do kind of um, work, go through that cycle of emotions. Um, and that's one of those other things that can be channeled through the problem solving training um, because it's responsive to the needs and the immediate circumstances that the care partner is going through. That makes sense. It is, I think, back to my quicksand example, I think people, you know, in the early stages of the disease, it's not 
too terribly difficult. Like with my mom, I just had to pay attention to what she was doing with in our business. Um, make sure she wasn't telling clients things that weren't doable. And the next thing you know, it's like, you know, they, they can't fend for themselves. They are forgetting how to eat. They forget how to use the, the facilities. All the stuff that, come, you know, it just, you just get sucked in. And sometimes just taking a step back and being able to say, what's my primary goal? Because obviously you can't fix them. You can't cure them. You need to keep them safe. You need to make them as happy as possible. And I think sometimes when you think about just those two factors, like I said a minute ago, my main goal was to give my mom as much joy and quality of life as possible because I knew she would murder me if she knew she was in a memory care. <laughs> and I knew she would hate it. I knew she would hate like everything about the situation we were in. She would have felt exactly the same way I did, you know, just angry, frustrated, hating it, you know, wishing it would go away. She would feel the same way. And so I channeled my, I guess, negative emotions into finding a way of maybe making them more positive by doing things that I knew would at least be beneficial in the short, long term with her. And it, I don't know. I think I did okay. <laughs> there were days, there were some days, but we all have those days anyway, even if it's even if we're not dealing with somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia. So let me go. We were, before we started recording, I gave these guys a list of these questions I wrote down. We narrowed them down for you because I have too many because they're, like I said, their guide is so amazing. You guys are going to love it. So like finish listening to this and then you guys can download it really quick and, and go through it in your five seconds of free time. Cause I know you guys are all busy. So we are kind of talking about, prioritizing, getting things done. And your guide has a strategy for helping us learn how to prioritize our to-do list and getting things done. And I am a super organized person, but even I learned useful tips. So again, total miracle. So why don't you guys tell me your favorite ways of prioritizing life so that you get things done in a chaotic world. And we've definitely had some chaos in the last couple of years <laughs> or more, depending on how you look at life. Maybe we'll start with, um, let's start with Susan. She's been kind of quiet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say I guess very type A personality. I'm very like to, you know, be very structured and organized. And so I like to do lists. Me too. Um, but I also like to recognize, okay, what's in my control and what is outside of my control. That way we, I can you know, not really worry about what's outside of my control because that will happen the way it's supposed to happen um, and focus my attention more so on what I can control throughout the day, um, you know, and less on what I can't, like, for example, okay, uh, well, I don't drive to work anymore, right? But, like, I can't control the traffic, you know, um, but I can control, you know, if I'm driving you know like a safe distance or a safe speed or whatnot so helping me with like those feelings of helping lessen those feelings of like frustration with focusing on what I can control what I can't control um so like to-do lists really are my thing schedules planners whatnot but more so emphasizing on what I know is under my control Did that answer answer your question yeah definitely I love to be able to scratch off what I've done. Like my husband's like, you know, you could do that digitally, right? I'm like, yes, I do. And I can scratch it off digitally too, but I like pen and, and paper it's more for that. satisfying when you can just cross it off with a pen and paper, right? <laughs> Sharpie <laughs> or something. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I've learned, we had a three week road trip and it was very quiet and calm and relaxed. It was a trailer, trailer trip up the West Coast. And one of my goals when I got back was to, and this is this is like really complicated, but I'm like very it's like I need to do A, B, and C, and A is gonna take X amount of time and B is gonna take this amount of time and okay, so I can do these things on these days. So it's very, very structured and I got everything done so that I had more free time. But it also felt very regimented and I've worked from home for 16 years and we've had 18 months of, you know, not much else to do but be at home all the time. And I'm like, I need to I need 
less structure so I could do more stuff, but more structure. It was, it's very complicated. But so what I've started doing is recognizing that I have two tasks that should take about the same amount of time. So if I don't feel like doing task A today, I'll do task B that takes the same amount of time. So I'm trying to fit in some flexibility into my very structured schedule, <laughs> which obviously is not something you can do when you're caring for a loved one. But, you know, sometimes we have to reevaluate how we structure our days, which so the vacation was beneficial to kind of like see that I was very, very regimented so I could, you know, get through the neat, the to do's that had to be done so I could do the fun things. And that worked. But now it's like, it's a little bit more freeing. I don't feel quite as, you know, like on the same track. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm stuck all the time. So yeah, something that, that we hear often from care partners is just like, I don't have time, right? I need a break and I want to take the vacation, but I just don't have time. Um, and, and the, you know, very understandable, um, with, but I would say that, you know, with, um, problem solving training and just support, right. There's a self-care, um, component that is so, um, so important and that by using problem solving training and these strategies, it helps promote self-care and being able to, to make time for things. So and if I would say reframing the issue from I don't have time or I can't because I, I don't have time or I mean, the list of the reasons why we can't do things, you know, can be endless. Um, but to how do I make it happen? Um, and where maybe it's not a vacation, like a two week vacation, but maybe it's a moment during the day where it's just for you and you can focus on yourself and be mindful and, and, and just um, connecting to, with yourself um, as a care partner. And so um, that's one of the really neat things that I appreciate about problem solving training. It's just, it's, it redirects the attention from like what seems impossible to trying to make something that seems impossible, manageable and possible. And really just trying to um, find what works for you. You know, we all we, we want to try to be like other people, but we're all in unique situations, right? So we want to bring the back the focus back on us to see what works for us in the way we need it to work. Yeah, I see a lot of people on social media and their loved ones. They color for hours, or they they you know they do like I don't want to say finger painting. They use they do painting, but it's not like fancy painting obviously it's about the same skill level i would be at. and i tried art with my mom my mom was super creative she used to decorate cakes she made mommy and me dresses this was back in the 70s so we had like little matchy holiday dresses the three of us ladies in our family she did work woodworking later on in life what else did she do sewing i think i said that she was just very creative did a lot of crafty stuff and one of the common pieces of advice and it's still good advice just didn't work for me in this instance was you know take what they used to do and just simplify it so i did that and it still didn't work so i i look at all these people and their loved ones are painting and coloring and having a great time and it's like i don't know why my mom was incapable of doing that and it still frustrates me just a tiny bit just because i would like to understand why i think the biggest reason why was that her visual processing was really really bad she didn't wasn't able to differentiate like with a piece of paper with a there was one day she she chose a coloring book page that was a poodle which my my mom had poodles like my entire life and she couldn't figure out inside and outside the lines and it was just it was so frustrating for her and it was frustrating for me and it was just like oh my god so that, i think it was the last day we did that and i tried everything like leaf rubbing I didn't ever dive into like the really simplistic art forms because I was afraid that they would be too childish and that she would get angry at me that I was suggesting that she do baby things. So we just went to the park and watched children. <laughs> and sometimes we'd have ice cream, but that got to be too much of a mess. A cone, cup, no matter what it was, that woman made a disaster with ice cream. So we had to stop doing that too. But let me go on to your next tip because I think we talked about that one pretty well. So. Despite being past my caregiving stage, 
the past 18 months have been really challenging for me. We kind of touched a little bit on this, you know, because of the pandemic and already doing everything from home. It's just the isolation just has gotten really bad for me and it's not really getting better. I'm having to work at it really hard. Um, I, like I said, I've been working towards fixing this and your guide has some great ideas. So what suggestions does your guide have that all of us can use as a starting point to increase socialization for ourselves and for our, our person that we're caring for? Because I think sometimes, you know, this is one of those tips again, where like somebody points out the obvious. And one of the things I was thinking about as I was looking through your guide before we started recording is like one of the things that I miss is some of the stuff that our town hasn't done for the past two years. Like we used to have music in the park and we could walk there, you know, so we could like, I don't drink, but you know, you can like literally walk, drink a bottle of wine in the park, which they don't really let you do, but people get away with it and then come home. You know, and it's like, we have, a, there's like so many things that don't haven't happened in the last 18 months just here in town that I'm like, okay, I need to like actually like really look and figure out what, what is happening versus what, how it used to be. So I hope that makes sense. Sometimes I get a little rambly. <laughs> Yeah, it's Friday sense. afternoon. My brain is <laughs> is done for the week. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's it's important to, as we we've kind of touched on, to remember that self care is important, um, and you know that doesn't look the same for everybody. But like we talked about, if you're at your wits' end, right, it, there's probably something that you're neglecting that you need to do for yourself, and when we're in that place, a lot of times we're starting to, I think we tend to isolate even more um, because we think, oh, nobody will understand what I'm going through. I, again, I don't have time to, you know, talk to my friend about what's going on. I'm supposed to meet this person, but I, I just don't have time. You know, we tend to go to that place. And I think it's important to remember that we all need a balance, right? You know, we're spending a lot of our time at work caring for children, maybe, you know, and also caring for our care recipient or our loved one. Um, but it's important to remember that there are things that we need to do for ourselves. And part of that is being social. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of um, suggestions in the guide for things that you can you know, things that you can do. But I think to Susan's point, keep, if something doesn't work, keep trying. And also to your point, Jennifer, some things didn't work and other things did. And you have to remember that this person is being, is affected by a disease that changes their brain. They're not, the, they're not going to be the same person anymore. So the things that they liked before, they might not be able to do anymore. So you know, and I think one of the good things about the pandemic is that we've, that a lot of things are virtual now. So you can do a lot of things that you like see the Louvre and like, you know, and virtually, I mean, we couldn't do that kind of thing before. So, you know, look online, look at what your, what your city has to offer. You know, the Alzheimer's Association has a lot of events you can take part in, you know, even, even a support group is a social place, right? So I think there are a lot of things that we can do um, to keep that socialization and not isolate ourselves further. While you were talking, an idea popped into my head. Talk about a little late to the game is I might have been able to arrange meeting a friend at the park where I took my mom. I didn't always go to the same place because I like variety. So it, it got to the point where we ended up going to a park that was really close to her residence uh, because the timing worked out really well. It's back in the old days. My kids actually went to school, which they're doing again, I guess. But we would go to a park that was right next to door to an elementary school. And there was a lot more kids there because I think with the younger students, they would get out first and mom would go wait there until the older kids got out of school. So there was kind of always a lot of activity, a lot of different kids coming and going and I don't know why I never thought about inviting a friend to just come sit with me and just let my mom watch the kids and we could chat like I said a little late to the game but there's an idea you know as long as it's not smoky as sin outside like it is today out here in California <laughs> but yeah those are you know 
sometimes like that's why I wanted to have this conversation with you guys because sometimes, like I've said a couple times already, sometimes the obvious just isn't really obvious when you're just so immersed in caregiving and and trying to handle all the aspects of life and a lot of my friends still work so that made that part challenging but yeah i could have had people i could have invited but it was never a specific time like, mom and i'll be at the park at x time because you never know what you know my mom might have not wanted to go someday so i don't never never did think about that one yeah, a couple other things to help with that self care is uh, one, not thinking of it as a boy, thinking of it as an all or nothing thing, right? Sometimes we get caught up in that black and white thinking of if I can't do it the way I used to do it, you know, like let's say a night out for dinner with friends for a full dinner evening, then I can't do it at all. Um, and so, um, again, I'm with. The, through the problem solving training, you explore different types of options and how to make that work. So even if it's, it doesn't look exactly the way that it did before you were in the care partner role, um, there may be alternate ways of still getting that sense of connection and satisfaction and really just kind of like a social release um, that, that through alternate ways. Um, and, um, and the other thing I would add to is to thank or approach that self time, that self care time, or that time for yourself as an appointment with yourself. Right? We're we're usually pretty good at keeping appointments with other people, or if it's a doctor's appointment, like for the care recipient or for ourselves. But these um, things that may seem like bonuses or extras, um, like time for ourselves, or you know, going out to get our exercise. Um, they, they seem more kind of disposable when it comes to the schedule, when we're running uh, late or have a lot of things on our plate, then those are the types of things that sometimes kind of fall to the wayside. And so if we just even approach our thinking in a different way, avoiding black and white thinking, and also giving our self-care time the same level of priority as we would to other appointments, it's easier to stick to it. And they say that about working out too. And I, I've back when I started my workout journey, there was days I was like, oh, I want to go to the gym. I don't have that excuse now. We have a Peloton at home. So it's like, I have lots of, I've got dogs to walk. I've got a bike to ride. I've got the Peloton, right. lots of options. But there were days when it's like, I just don't want to go. I'm just going to put on my shoe. I'm going to put on my workout clothes. Oh, well, I've got my workout clothes on. I'll just get in the car. Well, I'm in the car. Let me drive. Drive to the gym. While I'm at the gym, I might as well go in. The next thing you know, you're done with the class. So it's just sometimes you just have to like motivate yourself for the next step. Not like, got to put on my clothes. I got to get in the car. I got to drive to the gym. Blah, 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 blah. When you look at it in the big picture, sometimes it's easier just to say, I'm just too tired to deal with that today. I don't want to do that today. But if you just like, well, I'm just going to put on my workout clothes. That'll motivate me. And then mm -hmm. I'm going to get the car. Well, okay. We're going to put on your workout mm -hmm. clothes and go up the stairs and stare at the Peloton. And then maybe you'll just decide to do, you know, they have 10 minute hit classes, which are really hard. And 10 minutes is about all you can do. <laughs> I love that though, Jennifer, because you're basically, you're kind of tricking yourself. You're setting up small goals that are manageable. So maybe the idea of getting to the gym for an hour, 45 minutes just seems way out of this world. But if you can break that down to all I need to do is put on my tennis shoes, my workout shoes, or my workout clothes, and then, you know, the next step to that and breaking it down, it does make it so much more manageable and so much more likely to go through with it. Because mm -hmm. it goes back to the idea of like focusing on what you already did or can do, right? Maybe I didn't go to the gym but I did put on my clothes and then I did do this and I did do that. So building upon all the smaller I can and I did to make that into that bigger picture of what your overall goal is. You could also have two golden retrievers who know, wait, that time of day and wait, they're headed to the closet. And yes, yes, wait, those are not walking. Those are your bike clothes. Dang it, man. I'm mad at you now. But seriously, like you can get up from the breakfast table to use the restroom and the dogs, okay, I got like a 70 and an 80 pound dog and they jump, bounce up and down, boing, 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 boing. So it's a lot, of, it's a lot of momentum. And then you look at it and you're like, sorry, we're going on the bikes today. And they just look at you like, I don't like you today. 
<laughs> so it's kind of a motivation when the dogs are like, yay, we're going for a walk. <laughs> like, and you feel guilty because it's like, it's very smoky out. I don't really want to take you for <laughs> Okay, fine, we'll go around the block. You know, sometimes it's just, you just need that little extra motivation just to, to you know, make it happen. And sometimes, like I said, just getting in the car, driving to the gym and, oh, hey, there's that gal I haven't seen for a while. Or, you know, I kind of miss my gym friends. But sometimes when I jump on the Peloton, it's like, I haven't done such and such instructor's class. And you choose one of their classes and you're like, I'm so glad I did so-and-so's class today because they're always so cheerful or uplifting or they all have different, you know, styles. So it kind of, kind of works the same way. It's not quite the solution to isolation, but it does help a little bit. So let's go on to the last tip. And this time I'm going to put my glasses because it's getting harder to read. It's getting to the end of the day. Um, this one I know everybody deals with on a daily basis and care partners. It's just off the charts most of the time. But the, your guide has tips for overcoming frustration and irritability. And I think, like I said, everybody could use Right now, I think we could all use as many of those tips as we can to avoid being frustrated and irritable. Just it's beneficial to ourselves not to feel that way, but it's also kind of beneficial to our relationships not to feel that way. So who wants to jump in on how do we overcome frustration and irritability? Well, I think the biggest or probably the first step to that is allowing yourself to have those feelings that you're having. And recognizing that feelings are normal. Um, we all, we tr tend to categorize feelings into like positive feelings and negative feelings. But that really says that there are bad feelings and good feelings. And maybe trying to shift away from that into feelings I'm comfortable having and feelings I'm not comfortable having, right? Because all feelings are valid. You're allowed to feel, you know, you're allowed to feel happy, angry, sad, um, or whatnot. And so recognizing that you can feel that way, I think that's probably the first step in overcoming that feeling, right? Because feelings are temporary. You won't always feel that way. Um, but in, try in trying to not feel, I think in trying to, to not feel that way, we tend to repress that and it, try to ignore it, which in the end just doesn't do anything. That feeling is still there. Um, so allow yourself to feel that way. I think what is more, um, important is how we express how we feel, right? Um, so three general rules that I like to use while I'm thinking about how I express my feelings. It's like, I can be angry, but in the way that I, I express my anger is don't hurt myself, don't hurt others, and don't hurt the environment, right? So allow yourself to feel that way. And express that feeling in a way that doesn't hurt yourself, doesn't hurt others, and doesn't hurt the environment. Um, I think that would help you overcome that frustration a lot quicker because you're working through it instead of trying to push it away and having it come back, you know, at later where you might be feeling also angry or overwhelmed and stuff like that. So my biggest tip for that would be let yourself feel that way. Can I ask how you? Yeah, how you, so you're not hurting yourself, the environment, or somebody else. So don't go burning down the neighbor's house because they're annoying you. Got it. <laughs> I'll make a note of that one. <laughs> somebody says something, well, here's a good example. I have very loud neighbors. There are days I just want to go over there and slap somebody. <laughs> so obviously that's not positive for me. It's definitely not positive for them. I obviously don't do this. <laughs> I go in the house. And complain about them but and that's also not really great but how like when you're in that moment and you just want to lash out which obviously is bad how do you take a step back from that edge of that cliff and handle it better what tip would you suggest for somebody who just wants to like punch something i think it just really goes back to recognizing how we feel honestly um and how we feel at that moment in time instead of i mean we're, we're human right like some we're not perfect sometimes we lash out sometimes we do things we're not very proud of depending on how we feel but i think something we could all benefit from is just recognizing that the feelings that we have are valid and they're normal and you know i feel like that would help us 
lash out less or be more less be less impulsive in expressing the way that we feel does that make sense mm -hmm. one of the things i do this is the days when they're all gone and it's very very quiet outside and i love it is i appreciate that time it's like oh, everybody's at work i can sit out here and listen to the air conditioner run or whatever but i also try to remind myself that they might know they're loud and they might know that they can hear me, but they really are trying to just annoy the crap out of me. It's not, it is not what they got up to do this morning. So I, I try to remind myself that yes, they're being inconsiderate and maybe they should like dial the volume down 20 or 40%, but they're not on the other side of the fence, just shouting and screaming at each other just to annoy me. So I try to, I try to, take the frustration that not take it personal yeah that's a good way mm -hmm. of putting it and there's yeah. other noises where it's like i don't want to listen to this anymore and then i like sometimes it's a kid and after a while it's like okay i'm done listening to this kid toddler but then i try to like turn it around and say but like really think about it jen the kid is having a really good time that's why they're shrieking and screaming for the last two hours so, Jennifer, <laughs> something i really like about what you're saying is that i mean you know your triggers right and so as another strategy knowing what your triggers are um you know you can anticipate how um how you might want to tend to react or want to react right so like susan is saying um, validate your emotions. So you know your triggers, you know the emotional response that you tend to get or you're likely to get from those triggers. And then now that you know that you can anticipate so that when those triggers do come up or when you do find yourself feeling that way, you can have a plan in advance for how you can react or respond, right? So maybe that is putting some space between you and whatever it is that that trigger is to buy yourself time. If you are one of those people that are um, maybe a, a little less filtered or, or may tend to respond, want to respond right away. Um, but using those problem solving strategies again. So being, being that self-awareness, knowing what, what are those things that tend to increase the stress levels knowing what, what type of emotional response we tend to get. And then we can have some tools in our pocket anticipating because we know those moments are going to come up. Unfortunately, and <laughs> I'm, a, I'm the kind of person that's like, it's like the frustrations build up and then explosions happen. So I've learned to not let them build up so that the explosion doesn't happen. I had a guest right before my mom passed away last year that talked about mindfulness and I know I'm from Northern California and I'm not that far from Berkeley, but I'm not into the woo woo stuff as I like to put it, which I know is not, not the nicest way of referring to it, but he had tips that were really super helpful and it's, it is kind of acknowledging triggers and stopping and saying like, why the, the one thing that I learned from him was to like basically greet an emotion. So, when my mom was in the hospital and I was trying to figure out, do we do the surgery to repair her leg? And, you know, is that going to be a good thing for her brain? With the blah, 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 blah. Next thing you know, you're like whoosh, spinning out. And of course, this was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So life was chaotic and confusing and scary and just like pump the brakes was kind of my feeling. And there was this one day I was literally walking across the, you know, the living room. And I could just, I could feel it. The explosion was coming and it's just me and my husband here. And I'm like, I don't like, I'm going to explode. We're going to have a fight. It's going to just ruin the rest of the day. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. He said to stop. So I did. I literally stopped in the middle of the room, closed my eyes and said, hello, anger. Why are you here? And immediately a switch flipped. And it was like, I'm just trying to do the best thing for my mom. And in literally like less than 30 seconds, I went from about to have an explosive negative reaction to life and making my day worse to feeling really, really good about myself. And some, so I have built on that by acknowledging what like, okay, this kid is, I'm done listening to him shriek, but you know what? He's having a good time. So since he's still outside shrieking, I'll just go in the house and do something productive because that's beneficial to everybody. And it's, I guess it's kind of also part of the problem solving skills that you're, that you've been talking about is just to like, just don't 
sometimes it's like just take a step back and don't react kind of maybe find a you know like a positive thing way to look at it and then remove yourself from the situation if you can and if you can't re remove yourself from the situation like i know people have dealt with some explosive issues in the bathroom to uh i'm trying to keep that rated g there none of us wants to deal with that but you know what sometimes you just have to look at it and just laugh because it's either that or cry so that's kind of how i've tried to manage the last couple of years still learning <laughs> Was there anything else that we wanted to talk about on frustration and irritability before I kind of conclude with my last question? I think it's just important to remember that we all have different ways of dealing with those emotions. And these are just some tips, but we're all going to, you know, laughing at it is one way to do it. Um, naming it is another way, right? So these are, these are all different and, you know, like we're like we've been saying you just keep trying you find a way that works for you and you use that then you find some extra solutions for when those don't work that, that's my that's what i've been doing during this pandemic <laughs> so are you guys still looking for care partners for your study yes. three nodding heads okay <laughs> so i will make sure what is it they should go to your website and apply I want, to, I want to make sure I, I give people the opportunity to connect with you if they're interested. There are a couple of ways um, that you can contact us. So we do have an email and that email is checked uh, regularly. We do have a link where you can actually go and apply yourself. And we do have a phone number. So there are various ways to do that. And um, either way of they're all pretty efficient. Like they're all checked regularly. Um, so we're whatever is easiest for you, email, call, or applying yourself. Okay. So I'll make sure those are all in the show notes for everybody. This was, this has been super helpful. I had a really long conversation with these guys before vacation. Almost have to split my summer into before and after. <laughs> it's been an interesting summer. And I, like I said, you can, download their guide that's also linked in the show notes i've looked through it i've read through it it really really is good you guys have put a lot of effort into that it shows and i really appreciate that you guys are also one of the things we didn't really touch on is you're trying to help care partners with their own lives so it may not be in just how to deal with caregiving and aspect of things for people in the sandwich generation or people that are working you're also trying to find coping, problem-solving skills for you know people that are trying to balance family, you know, responsibilities, job responsibilities, caregiving responsibilities, which is a lot of people. So yeah, I think you guys so are the, on the to really it. the really neat thing about it is that it's a skill set to that we practice together during the participation of this study. Um, so that the um, participant can learn, become proficient and just really learn to use it. And it can be applied to any type of life situation. And so it can be applied toward figuring out situations that come up in terms of being a care partner or anything else, any other aspect of life. So it can be really individualized. Um, and I also want to mention that some of our, um, our study team is active on Twitter. I know you mentioned Twitter earlier, Jennifer. And so I think, one of our I think hashtags, that's how we connected. Yes. So one of our hashtags um, for the study and care partner information is hashtag C A D E S. It's the abbreviation for um, for the study. Um, and there are a few other hashtags in there um, that um, that we that we also post. But um, that's the easiest one to remember if anyone wants to kind of connect with us um, or find more information about the study too. Awesome. Well, I appreciate this very much. It is Friday evening where they're at. So they've given up a little bit of their time for all of us. And I appreciate it tremendously. I appreciate this course of study that you guys are taking on. And I wish you guys all the best of luck. And I hope you guys all have a fantastic weekend. I know those episodes come out on Tuesday. So this probably sounds a little weird, but whatever. People listen all the time. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> Well, thanks so and much I, for having us, Jennifer. We really enjoyed getting to talk to you. Awesome. You. I appreciate it. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.